Hello and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2 for the second part of this end of series summary. In part 1 I talked about how we built up a base of resources on Norvis and then moved up into Norbit to do the more advanced sciences. In this video I'm going to cover our trips off to other planets and talk about where we'll go in the next series. So I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the, uh, the various sciences that you bring in, each of them requires a specific um, exo material. So energy science for example you have to bring in holmium which is uh, this sort of pinkish uh, plate here so that gets fed down and into lots of the different systems down here for whatever, whatever it is you're using it for. Um, for biological science similarly you're bringing in, um, this is vitamolange, this is actually vitamolange extract, there is also vita spice, there's vita this, that and the other, all of this is needed in large quantities for uh, for the science to be done and each area has its own own requirements and all of these exotic materials have to be brought from another planet so this is the list of planets we've gone out to and each of them if you go out there they will have a a, a primary resource so for example Drakit's primary resource is cryonite uh, Tyshikutan's is is, vul is vulcanite Bigrid is is vitamolange and that means that if you if you go out and do core mining on those planets you get out special core chunks that have quite a lot of that resource and then a little bit of all of the other resources and also, each of these planets will then have some significant patches of those particular resources. So if we go out and look at Kothar, for example, um, this is an iridium planet. So if we if we look at the um, if we look at a core mining drill, like oops, here's here's one here, this is digging up the and these are iridium core fragments, and you can tell because they've got they're a sort of yellowish colour, and they get fed into these pulverizers, and as you can see, we get quite a lot of iridium ore out of them, as well as a little bit of stone and and some core, and some normal core fragments, the grey things. So we're then splitting out the iridium ore goes up that way. The stone goes down here for whatever processing, and then you've got the um, and then you've got a supply of the uh, normal core fragments coming down here, which go into the core fragment processing facilities. And if you've been watching these uh, videos for long, you'll recognise this as being a system that essentially brings in core fragments and outputs delivery cannon capsules. And this is great because we decided as a sort of a a bit of a challenge we were going to try very hard to not really use cargo rockets for massive logistics. We are using them to get resources from Norvis to Norbit because there isn't really any way to get round that at the stage of the game we were at until uh, last week. But uh, for all of the exoplanets, we're attempting to deliver all of the resources they produce. So in this case, immersium, coming, immersium crystals coming out here, being shipped off by delivery cannon. Over here, the actual iridium, which is what this planet is for, is being shipped out from here. So these, these various receivers will, will get a signal signal from the planet or whatever whatever outpost requires iridium and then the guns will send the iridium over there great that works pretty nicely and we're trying yes as I say we're trying very hard not to just ship these things around by rockets um, and this has happened largely because when I played Factorio uh, Space Exploration 0.5 as my previous run through and stream and so on um, I got a bit fed up with having to supply all of my exoplanets with the um, with the parts for to build rockets and so I thought well if we go with with the um, delivery cannons, these are things that can be made on site from local ingredients. It'll be much, much easier rather than trying to manage shipping rocket components back and forth. Because you need a hundred of them to build a rocket, but then you get some of them back at the other end. So there's then the logistics of trying to send those over and they're, they're, and they're too complicated to realistically make on site. And so you end up with rockets taking rocket parts over and it's, it's all a bit of a headache. And I thought, let's not do that. Let's just use delivery cannons and try and rush spaceships. Now that was a great idea, except that with the extra complexity of factor of space exploration 0.6 and of Crastorio 2, it's taken quite a lot longer than I was expecting to get to spaceships. So we've had to ship a lot more stuff by delivery cannon than I was really expecting when I set that challenge. That said, we have largely stuck with it, with uh, one with one notable exception that I shall gloss over. All of our exoplanets follow roughly the same sort of general pattern. There'll be a system on them for producing power, and for quite a lot of them that is what we have termed the free power system. And it's called free power because it doesn't require any resource inputs apart from water, which on most planets is quite abundant. And will then you then use that water and some electricity to grow wood. You then feed the wood into the into these fuel refineries, which turn it into biomethanol, and you then burn the biomethanol in these um, in these gas power stations. So you get fuel literally from, you get electricity literally from water. And so early on in the game, that was great. It was generating loads of power um, because this is all an, a net positive. You produce significantly more power than you, than you, um, than you use. This is a net positive, allowed us to produce loads and loads of power from no inputs other than water. Absolutely fantastic. The problem is, because there's a lot of fluid 
processing happening in here. There's, there's lots of different fluids in here. It's quite a big in piece of infrastructure. And if we look on a Norvis, which is where obviously we're using a lot more power because it's such a big planet, there's so much going on on it. We have absolutely enormous areas of this system set up, like this one here. And all of this up here, this is this is crazy size. I mean, look at all of this. And so this is having playing an absolute number on our uh, on our UPS, which is how fast Factor of the game is capable of running the updates. So you can see at the moment I'm running at almost 50, which isn't bad actually. Um, but for some reason, whenever I'm streaming, that seems to drop quite a lot down to about 30, which is the game running at about half speed. Uh, and that's problematic. So we are working on ways of fixing that. But I digress. That was our initial way of generating power. So if we go off and look at look at look at a planet, we have. This is a different planet, but you can see we've got the same sort of free power system set up here. Then we'll have a system of um, meteor defense guns. In this case, we're bringing in um, the ammunition from it from um, by, by rocket, simply because we haven't needed that much of it. I brought in loads by rocket ages ago, and it's been sufficient. But if we look at, say, Taras, for example, I expect this one's been done properly. Here we have a more advanced version of it that operates around delivery cannons. So there's a set of delivery cannons that are shipping copper and sulfur and water ice and steel um, and wood over to over here by delivery cannon. That's then passed through all of these machines. So we make uh, we make we make electronic we make uh, copper cables, which we turn and that and wood can be turned into a, a green circuit. Um, we t we melt the water the ice into water. We combine that with iron and sulfur to make sulfuric acid, we can, uh, which we are able to then use to make batteries. And we can then combine the batteries and the green circuits to make the actual ammunition for the meteor guns. So this system is entirely. Self, it's not, it's not self-contained, but it will keep itself running without requiring any resources to be brought in from this planet. We just have a steady stream of uh, delivery cannon capsules bringing in the resources required, and then we have a essentially unlimited amount con quantity of ammunition and a crazy, crazy number of um, of meteor defense guns as well. So this will keep the planet completely safe. We will then also have one of these systems, and this is an umbrella defense which protects the planet against any coronal mass ejections. Uh, this is based around a number of boilers which will be um, powered by, well in this case it's going to be presumably powered by a, oh no this, one, this one's a, a nuclear power plant, um, probably because we're having the UPS issues and we thought that a nuclear plant like this would be significantly better for our um, uh, for the computers than, uh, than building up an entire uh, free power system. So we're generating power here from nuclear. We're using some of that power then to boil water. So actually, with this being nuclear, we could tap off some of the steam from here and put it into these tanks. But that's a more advanced system that we haven't bothered with in this particular case, apparently. Um, but anyway, if we're building, it, if we're doing it from free power anyway, we then need to boil water in these boilers, fill up these tanks, and then we've got all these. And then these act as a steam battery. So there's loads and loads and loads of energy stored in all in the steam in all of these tanks. And then when a coronal mass ejection happens and we need suddenly huge amounts of power, typically a gigawatt or so, all of these turbines can then kick in, turn the steam into, into electricity, and that will power the umbrella defense for as long as it's needed. And then after that it'll go back to sleep and we can and we can and the system can generally calm down and we and we, yeah, we end, uh, and and fill these tanks back up again ready for the next one. I'm now gonna go back over to Talos, because this is this is the planet I built up, and therefore I'm much more familiar with how it works and some of it than the other than the other one. So it's gonna be easy just easier for me to point at things because they're all fairly similar. Um, so again, we, we've gone out here and we're, our plan when we started playing was to try and essentially run everything off core mining. In, and in 0.5 that was fairly realistic. My base towards the end of my run was running almost entirely from um, resources coming in from core mining. Um, Unfortunately, in 0.6, core mining is significantly harder. You can't just put down half a dozen of them. You have to go off to these special core seams and put mines on those. So, on this planet, I've gone out, I've, I've picked up some core seams. There's one, two, three, four, five, six out here. And I've also, because we didn't have, because the core mines aren't producing enough, I've also had to then go in and, and set up some of these additional outposts. And these, these are pulling in, these are just barrel mines. So there is, with this being a beryllium planet, there are as well as as well as the core fragments producing um, beryllium when you crush them. There are also decent patches of beryllium around. So there's six and a half bit million there, five point eight million there. There's four point two million in that one, and that's half hidden. And then we've got some nice big ones like that ten there and twelve there. So I put in mines on the on the big ones that I found, and those are then that's then bringing in bringing in the beryllium over here. So we've got a system where the, the core chunks are all being dropped off here, like on, like you saw on the Iridium planet earlier. It's pretty much equivalent. We're feeding those in, and again. Same sort of thing, you get out the, the beryllium, you get out bits of stone, you get out some core chunks, and then those are being fed through here in order to process them down. Through the ver there are various steps required to eventually produce beryllium ingots on the output. Now, each different um, exotic material has a very, very similar feel and system, 
but the, 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 the methods of processing are going to be quite different. Beryllium is one of the easier ones. There's only one, two, three, four, five steps to go through, and they're all relatively simple. There's no weird feedback loops. If we take a quick look at Kothar, this is probably the most complicated one, and um, rather slightly unfortunately, we sent Mike off to do this one, not realising how complex it is, and Mike is, out of the group of us, is probably the least experienced Factorio player, so that was a little bit unfortunate. Um, he's also got too many core fragments in here, that, sh that should be dealt with. Uh, so this one requires, yes, you pulverise it down into probably powder, uh, or no, cru sorry, crushed iridium. Then over here you process it again and you need you need these, um, are these I think these are cation beads, which require a whole extra step to produce them. Um, and then this step has most of the things that go in also come back out again, so you've got lots and lots of feedback loops to worry about in here as well, and you need, and you need a supply of... Um, of nitric acid as well, and 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 and. So this one is this one is rather overcomplicated, as you can see. So we'll go. Let's let's go back over to Talos, where things are a little bit simpler, because it's the general concept that I'm trying to look at here. <laughs> yes. So then you you've got all of those. Um, when once you've got your supply of whatever it is being fed through here, you can then feed it down to again to the delivery cannons, and we've got a couple of delivery cannons here that are shipping shipping the ingredients, shipping the stuff out, and also shipping out any excess, uh, in this case copper, there's probably going to be a bit of excess sand, yes, some glass, be sand's being turned into glass and shipped out there, so we have a set of delivery cannons around here that are getting rid of all of the waste products from this uh, facility and sending them off to elsewhere to be, to be appropriately dealt with. So, as we've been going, we've gone off to a number of different planets, as you can see here. We started off by going, going out to, um, so we started on Norvis, and, and, and then we went to two of the moons of Norvis, Drakit and Taishakutan, because the very first things we needed for the, the almost the zeroth tier of space science was uh, cryonite and vulcanite, so the cold and hot rocks, for want of a better description for them. Um, and those were, those were okay, but the problem is those are very, very small moons, as you can see here, by the, these, these numbers are the size of the planet or the, or the planetoid. So we weren't really able to get enough from those. And so since then we've also gone out to Agnea and Snowdrop to try and get larger quantities of both of those and currently those seem to be okay. The other thing you have to consider as well as size and the resources on a planet is that there's a number of biters on them. So you can see, you'll, you'll see that most of these have zeros by them and that means they are friendly planets, they don't have any biters on them, they're nice safe places to go out to. Um, but there were a few where we've had to deal with uh, with biters. So Big Red was that the Vita Melange planets, and Vita planets always have biters on them. You can't, you, there, there's no such thing as a, a Vita planet with no biters. Even if you go in and try and wipe them out, you'll still potentially get more of them coming in riding meteors, which is very unfortunate. Uh, so, yes, you need, to, you need to be a little bit careful of those, but that, so that had 17%. Talos was a fairly difficult one, the one I've been showing you at the moment. And that's why my uh, my, my base here is is, is, is is ringed by. In fact, I'll turn on turrets. There we go. It ringed by turrets up here, and then all of my outposts have got these little loops of turrets around them. And I am being very very careful to keep the the atmosphere around them clean. We've got lots. We've got the um, the, the air air scrubbers there. And hopefully, let's let's see how well that's actually been working. If we flick over to the uh, pollution view, you can see that yes, okay. There's a little bit of pollution along the railway lines. Um, and a little bit around here that's perhaps maybe I need a little bit more in around the, uh, the, the the main base up here. But it's essentially, most of the pollution is being cleaned up inside the outpost before it manages to uh, to, to, to leak out anywhere and, 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 and upset the biters. So that's working really quite nicely. Other people have approached the biters slightly differently. So if we look at on Big Rid, uh, Mark has gone for a massive um, perimeter wall. Let's turn his turrets on. You can, see, you can see that he's gone all the way around here. He's claimed this huge area. And that means he can then just go nuts inside here and do whatever building he wants. And he's probably also, yes, he's, he's con containing all of his pollution down in a small area here. Mike has done a similar thing over on Kothar, um, except he's decided to start on the corner of a planet, um, which is a weird thing to say, when, especially because it's a circle, and also planets are normally thought of as sp spheres. But yes, he's built a, he's walled off an enormous corner of the chunk of this planet. Um, and if I turn off the pollution graph, you can see that actually he's only built in quite a small area of this. So he did go a bit, um, he did get a little bit carried away, but I think he was enjoying the combat as an excuse to get away from having to uh, think his way through the, uh, <laughs> the um, iridium processing recipes. The other interesting thing to note about that is his, his pollution seems a lot worse in that it's covering a much, much larger area. There's much, much deeper shades of red. But that's because he's got all of his um, cleaning happening around the edge of it. So he's just allowing this whole area to get as polluted as it wants. He doesn't care uh, as long as none of it can cross the, um, the the wall going all the way around here. And and it can't. It is keeping all of the pollution in. So it is. this is, again, I'm not, I, I should probably state that I'm not criticising this, much as I like to criticise Mike. Um, I'm just pointing out that, it, yeah, I'm just saying he's doing, doing it in a, in a 
slightly different way. I was going to say another interesting thing is uh, this water appears to be blocking the pollution, but actually now I look slightly more closely. No, it's because the uh, the belt of, um, of filters is going along the the edge of the uh, edge of the lake, so the, the uh, pollution is being stopped before it gets to the water, which is why it's nice and blue and full of fish. So yeah, so the, we, we, the, the different planets all have their own challenges and, and, and slight differences. So some of them, for example, for example, Talos has basically no oil on it. Uh, this that is, that is basically none. Uh, so it's not you can't realistically go out there and start and and, and and mine up oil for making plastic or whatever. So I'm having to bring that in by delivery cannon. It's got a, a, a reasonable amount of iron, so I can get that from there if I wanted. Um, but yeah, generally it's got loads of beryl, which is why I went there. But it's lacking in other things. You'll tend to find that most planets have some sort of shortage. And the most important thing, well, if we if we have a look at the uh, this table here, this sh this shows which planets have biters and which ones don't, and also which planets we've gone off to. And you can sort of see. Why each we need we obviously need all of the resources here. Although except I say I say that we haven't gone off to a uranium planet yet, and we haven't gone to an oil planet, or an iron or or iron stone coal. So we haven't gone off for the mundane resources yet. We're still able to get those on Norvis in sufficient quantities. But for all of the exotic resources, we've had to pick up all of those. And where we can, we've generally gone for the uh, the planets without biters, but sometimes we've had to expand out to other ones as well. Other things that make things complicated. So Agnea, for example, is a waterless planet, as you can see here. So there is no no water on this planet, so that means no free power, and most of the power generation systems in this game require water because you're, well, like in the real world, you're making heat from something and using it to boil water. So, for example, on this on, on this planet, I've ended up going for a, a nuclear power plant, but that does require a supply of water. We are, we are our, our nuclear reactors get a uh, burn the burn the fuel cells and get hot because that's how nuclear reactors work. Um, I'm noting a. Uh, that this isn't fast enough. I'm going to need to put some um, modules in that apparently. But yeah, so that it, re it boils water and then you re and then you and then you put the pass that through turbines and release it as steam. So it still needs water to generate the power. So what we've got over here is a system where we're bringing in ice by delivery cannon, melting that ice, pumping and then pumping it out into the in, into the system over here, um, allowing us to re to use it. And because that water is relatively expensive, we're then using the condenser turbines, which means you don't get quite as much electricity out of the uh, per, from the from the heat that goes in, but you do get your water back, and that's quite important. So or you, you get most of your water back. So we don't have quite the same drain on the water that we would otherwise have. So each planet has its own challenges and is, is, is the reason why we, we may or may not have chosen what seems like an obvious planet to go to. So I think that's pretty much everything I want to tell you about our um, about how, how the game is going at the moment. As you can see here, here are all the planets, and it, unfortunately it doesn't show us it doesn't show how we've uh, which ones we've um, which ones we've colonised yet. But there's pl plenty of planets out there. We've done lots of exciting travel. So the next thing is, what are we going to do next? So the big thing that the uh, the get the whole game, in fact, even Vanilla Factorio, the whole thing is based around logistics. So in the future, one of the there's a couple of big things that we want to do. One is to get this space elevator uh, up and running properly. So we've got, we've got a space elevator. We now need to start. We need to build the cable. We need to start maintaining it, and we need to start putting trains through it because that's the um, we've got the space elevator. We need to start using it. So we'll have to have a good think about how we're going to get the stuff into the trains and out of the trains at the top end. There's quite a lot, quite a lot of thinking to do about this, but once we do get it up and running, it'll be very, very powerful. The other thing we need is spaceships. That's gated behind Astro Three, which isn't too far off at this point and then once we've got space once we've got spaceships and space elevators we can start br realistically bringing resources between the exoplanets and Norvis orbit and Norvis without faffing around with delivery cannons because the delivery cannons are they're okay when you're getting started but each time they fire they only take a, s a single stack of resource with them so when you're building when you've got something that's being in fairly high demand you tend to find there's a very very steady stream of the cannon of the cannon capsules flying in and even then it's still not really enough they're just a bit they're efficient in that they're ch quite cheap with resources especially compared to rockets but they just they aren't very quick on the throughput and they require lots of they're just a bit fiddly, whereas a rocket can come over with 500 stacks in one go. Granted, it costs a lot more to do it, but it can bring 500 stacks. And a tra and a spaceship can bring 500 stacks if there's a single warehouse in it, or as you do more research, you can get more and more and more stuff into them. So they're going to be much, much better ways of transporting stuff around. But still, some uh, more, more research and more development is going to be needed there. The other nice thing about the elevator is you can use it to transmit power. So we can use that down on if we sh if we then put a load of solar panels in orbit where they get a lot more power, a lot more energy per solar panel because the sun is so much brighter up in orbit. We can then bring that down in the space elevator, 
and then we can get rid of these. Um, we can get. We can move all of these. All these solar panels can be moved up into orbit, and we can get rid of all of this free power stuff. And hopefully, the game will start running a bit quicker again. Because yeah, I suspect this. Uh, we we do believe this is where a lot of the um, a lot of the UPS drain is coming from. So looking really looking forward to that. One of the other big exciting things about having space elevators is going to be doing more processing down on Norvis. So in previous games, when I haven't had the space elevators and therefore the um, logistic cost of getting stuff from planets to orbit has been relatively high, I've tended to do building. I've, I've tended to do making of all of the, the sort of the exotic, more slightly more exotic versions of the uh, of uh, material. So. The beryllium would have been brought to, nor to to orbit as it is here, and then made into the the plates and the rods and the scaffolds and so on up here in orbit because you don't want to be massively you don't want to be handling stuff too many times, sending it for up and down and up and down and, and, and dropping it down to down to the planet and then bringing it all back up again. But now that we get once we have um, the space elevators, it's going to be much much cheaper to bring stuff up into orbit. So we can start doing things like making the uh, aeroframe scaffold here on planet and then ship it uh, where we can use lots and lots of productivity modules like this and then that'll that'll seriously reduce the amount of beryllium we get through at the sort of the slight cost of a, a slightly higher running cost on the space elevator and so this will be this will allow us to save on quite large quantities of material but it'll require us to redo lots and lots of the infrastructure up here in in, in orbit in order to ship the uh, in order to ship in the, the bits and the various bits and pieces where they're actually needed the other part of that is it's going to then become um, sensible and, e and efficient and, and just generally a good idea we think to ship all of the scrap down to Norvis for reprocessing so all of this we feed it through here and the scrap goes in. some of the science packs for example a lot of the material ones will produce hundreds of scrap per science pack you produce and so if we can take all of that away and then turn it into okay so you bring in one scrap and you get about a 50% chance of getting something out and then all, all of these ores that are coming out of it you can then reprocess to make into all into, into the metals and then feed them back into the system again and if we can then chuck productivity modules in here as well then we're going to get a lot more of what each of those resources out so we're going to be able it, it'll make everything a lot more a lot more effective the thing is you could because you can't use productivity modules in space in general a couple of exceptions um, Doing all of these steps back down on Norvis will allow us to get a lot more metal out, and I think that will probably more than offset the cost of sending it up and down in the um, in the space elevator. Now, obviously, we're going to have to go off and do lots of designing and building in order to do that, but, you know, that's what the game's all about. So that's another thing we're seriously considering. The other thing is, as I was saying earlier when I was talking about all of the um, the, the, the metal processing, is there's some big upgrades available over there. So we've got a couple, once we've got this advanced chemical plant finished, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll think about a slightly higher tier of, um, of productivity modules. So we do actually, we already have productivity module 5 researched. They're just so expensive we haven't made any. And that goes back, that goes against what I said about always having your highest modules in your science labs we should definitely get some of those made up because i think we we do just about have the bits and pieces for that so that's definitely top of the priority list we should we really really should do that um but yeah so we can we can maybe then start thinking about maybe certainly tier three productivity modules maybe even some tier four ones that's expensive in vitamilange extract but it might be worth it so we can get these up and running and then hopefully that'll allow us to um produce all of the resources we need at a much cheaper rate and 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 very very high on the list the red circuit production because there's such a shortage of it here we have completely it is caused the um the the memory card production to grind to a halt and now that's causing all the rest of the factory to grind to a halt so that's a big problem we're going to need to sort that one out so there is lots to do lots more science packs to get on with and lots of um resource throughputs to deal with so i uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode it's gone on a bit longer than my uh, than they normally do but you know it's it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big summary we've done a lot of stuff i hope it's been interesting and you'll come along and join us on monday for the uh, next stream when we should be getting on with this there will of course be videos throughout the week other videos throughout the week as usual uh thank you very much for watching and i'll see you next time bye bye